Well, good morning. Uh, last week, we uh, started the story of Joseph from Genesis. And we uh, talked a lot about that word that we kept bringing up was brokenness. And we talked about how brokenness, it breeds more brokenness, which we can see today, even um, as Steve was sharing. We left Joseph at the end of last week. He had been sold off to slavery. We have Joseph who was at the height of power in his own family. He was the favorite. He was loved. He was cared for. Um, dad and mom loved him. He got a special coat. And then he was brought down to the low, right? Put in a pit, sold off into slavery. And so we'll, we'll walk right into Genesis 39 and talk about and read what happens next. So 39 verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. An Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard. If you have your Bibles, I would circle that captain of the guard. We'll come back to that in a moment. Bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor in his master's sight and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. The Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields. He left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, which is important for the next part. Okay, he went from being the high in the family, like the favored one, to the least. He's now a slave. He's lost everything. You realize that, right? Joseph is the only guy in the story in the beginning, earlier last week, who really wasn't experiencing the brokenness that all the other siblings were living and enduring and creating. Okay, he seemed to be a little bit more exempt. It was around him, but he was favored. And so he didn't actually get to experience that. He had no clue, it seems like, that his siblings really hated him that much. I mentioned one thing he didn't have was self-awareness. He shared his dreams about how they would all bow to him and they got more and more angry. And so he shared another dream about how they would all bow down to him and they got even more angry. And so for the first time, imagine being Joseph in the bottom of his pit, finally realizing they really don't like me very much. My brothers, who I was coming to check on, hate me. And they sell him off into slavery. For the first time, I would say, the brokenness of the family has truly impacted and affected Joseph. And what you'll see in Joseph's story is the brokenness around him, he doesn't own it. What I mean is, he doesn't allow it to be an excuse to simply be broken. Joseph is a guy who continues to work and continues to serve whatever circumstance he is in. He's an incredible uh, person in, in, in Scripture uh, to, to try to be like in so many ways. So Joseph is now under control or, uh, and has the authority of the entire house of the captain of the guard, Potiphar. That, that's pretty high stakes. It's a pretty, pretty good shift there from being a, simply just a slave. He's well trusted. And we, it's very important that you realize in Scripture it tells us God is the one blessing the work. It's not Joseph who's the one who's just really talented and really good. It's God doing the blessing. Very important that that's a big part of what's happening here. It's God doing the work. And he's handsome, which can be a flaw in this story. It certainly is. Because Potiphar's wife is very, very interested in this good-looking guy named Joseph. And she says, sleep with me, Joseph. 
And he is not interested in doing that. In fact, in verse uh, 9, he says, uh, no one in this house is greater than I am. He, Potiphar, has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? Joseph knows about God. And he's taking it to heart. He could easily have said, you know, God, where is God at? I'm in slavery. My siblings want to kill me. Where is this God at? I don't believe in him. And instead, he continues to follow and be faithful to the God of his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather. He could have easily done the deed with the wife and maybe got away with it. But he's not interested in being sinful or being evil in the sight of his God. He is still righteous. And day after day, she continues to, to ask him and beg him and, and try to coerce him into sleeping with her. And he continues to say no and no and no. In verse 11, now one day he went into the house to do his work and none of the household servants were there. Danger, danger, Will Robinson, right? Red flag shooting up. What's happening? No accountability, no witnesses. I have talked to youth and, and, and young adults and said, you've got to have accountability. You've got to have some guardrails to protect yourself. Two options present themselves to Joseph here because the wife comes back again and wants to sleep with him. There's no one around. Opportunity comes up. There's no one's going to see it. I can get away with it. Option number one, or what happens, option number two, there's no one to say it didn't happen. It's my word versus hers. Verse 12, she grabbed him by his garment and said, sleep with me. But leaving his garment in her hand, he escaped and ran outside, flee from sexual immorality. He wanted no part. Now, side note, this is the second time he's lost his robe. He's not good with clothes, is he? <laughs> and that's what happens, is, is she is embarrassed or angry or whatever word you want to use, and she screams at the top of her lungs, and the servants who, who weren't around suddenly are around, and she says, he tried to rape me, and he left his clothes here, and, and that Hebrew is, is a bad guy. And Potiphar comes home from work and she tells him the same story. And he gets angry, furious, the word is, and throws him into prison. And that's what Joseph was next. Okay? Height of his family, favored, loved, cared for by dad anyway, right? Then bottom of the physical pit, slavery. Top of the household in the prison that he was given to, the, the owner, Right? Now he's thrown into prison, bottom. You see this whole up and down, up and down thing happening with Joseph? I mean, could you imagine if it was you? How broken would you feel? At some point, do you just give up? Joseph could have, and not only anyone would fault him for it, but instead, it doesn't happen. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Who granted him favor? Who was it that granted favor? God. Okay, very important part of that. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority. And he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and the Lord made everything that he did successful. Family top, pit, slavery, bottom. And in the household of Potiphar, top, bottom, prison. Now he's top of the prison. There's no prisoner as high as Joseph in the prison. Given all kinds of authority. And the, the warden that says, you just take care of it. I'm not even worried about it. You're good. Because the Lord is blessing all that Joseph is doing. God has a very specific plan in mind for Joseph. And we'll get to that as the story unfolds over the next few weeks. Genesis 40, verse 1. After this, the Egyptian king's cupbearer and baker offended their master, the king 
of Egypt. Never a good idea to offend the king. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them into custody in the house of the captain of the guard. Same two Hebrew words, captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned Joseph to them, and he became their personal attendant, and they were in custody for some time. A lot's happening there, so let's just unpack it for a moment. Okay, the chief cupbearer, his job is to taste or make sure no poison enters the wine of the king. Okay, he is right next to the king almost all the time, either t- tasting or making sure no poison enters it. If you want to kill the king with poison, you somehow get the cupbearer in your pocket. That's how you do that. History t- has moments where the, moments where the cupbearer would be bought or would be threatened and would actually try to find a way to, to sneak some poison or fake drinking it so the king would be killed. So the king has to have absolute confidence and trust in the cupbearer because his life is really in his hands. So ingesting food or drink can kill the pharaoh. Okay, The baker also has a very important role of making sure the pharaoh is fed. Okay? Is the pharaoh mad because someone tried to kill him with poison? I don't know. But both these positions have to do with ingesting something. So I don't know. The, the wine went bad and the, food, the, the, the bread got burnt. I don't know. But something happened. Maybe someone tried to kill the king. We don't really know. And the pharaoh is so mad he throws him into prison. These are two fairly high officials in the land. Okay, now they're high, in, and certainly in the house of Pharaoh. And we know from politics, if some really rich person does something illegal, they are treated very, very well oftentimes, right? Even allowed to stay in their own home sometimes because they have some, some authority in the nation or they have some money. So they aren't thrown into just some random in some random prison cell in the bottom of a prison, they're taken to the captain of the guard's home, which is located somewhere in the prison, and they're treated very, very well. The captain of the guard, we have his name from earlier. It's Potiphar, the same guy who owned Joseph. Now, is it possible that job has changed? Yeah, it's possible. But there's something about having him named and using that same position again. I, I would tell you, Potiphar probably knows his wife pretty well. Okay, Joseph, I, you know. And he's seen the work that God has done in the prison. And he needs someone he can trust to take care of these two fairly powerful people. If they're set free and restored back to their power, if they were mistreated, they could cause some problems for the captain of the guard. So they put Joseph in charge. Potiphar sees something in Joseph. Either he recognizes through his faithfulness that he didn't do what he was accused of, or he simply just knows his wife pretty well, and he gets the one guy he can trust. The cupbearer and the baker have a dream each, the same night. And they're distraught. They're bothered by it. And Joseph comes in to check on them. And he sees how sad or how upset they are. And he says, what's going on? Well, we had a dream. Um, And in verse 8, we had dreams, they said to him, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. I want to pause it for just a moment. Who is the one doing all the work? God, right? God's one blessing us, the one who's making sure it all works out. Whatever Joseph does, it works, okay? There's something here, and we'll get back to it next week. So, So mark it in your Bible. Don't interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams, okay? Some would tell you that he is, in some way, elevating himself to be next to God. And it only is obvious because of what happens in the next chapter. We'll get to that next week. I want you to know that, okay? There's something there 
We know all is before this. Joseph is, is all about God doing the work. But now, hey, God does the, he'll interpret it, but tell me the dream. Verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. In my dream, there was a vine in front of me. On the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Verse 12. This is the interpretation. Joseph said to them, The three branches are three days, and three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cup bearer. Okay, you're going to be restored. Your dream is a good news for you. Don't be sad. You're going to have your job back. Your head will stay on your shoulders. Life's going to be good. Okay, and he tells him, but show kindness to me and tell Pharaoh about this dream and how it was interpreted. I was kidnapped from my home in Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing, and they should put me in the dungeon. So he tells, he tells the cupbearer, remember me when you leave here. Tell Pharaoh about me. I'm innocent. A chief baker's dream didn't have a very good ending. Verse, um, I think it's 16, is up there? I'll just read it to you. I had a dream also. Three baskets of white bread were on my head. In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods. For Pharaoh, but the birds were still were eating them out of the basket on my head. Here's what it means. So three baskets are three days. Three days are good. Three days again. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off of you. That's not good news. And hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from your body. Yuck. Okay, here's what's interesting. These dreams and their interpretations. Don't change anything. It doesn't, do, it doesn't change the story for the cupbearer or for the baker. Nothing changes for them in terms of the dream didn't cause something to actually happen to make something be different. The dream's intent, as we'll see, is God's working for what's going to happen later on. And we can read in verse 20. On the third day of Pharaoh's birthday, he gave a feast for all his servants. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position as cupbearer, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker just as Pharaoh, jo- jo- Joseph had explained to him. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And Joseph is left in the dungeon you would think, on some level, feeling broken. But he's not. Well, maybe he's hurt. But he continues to do that which he knows he is called to do, and that's to be righteous, to be faithful with whatever is given to him. Joseph is a character, a person through Scripture, who did not allow the brokenness of his family to be a crutch or an excuse. An example to me of, of because of my history, my family's history, it doesn't mean I have to relive that or, or um, recreate that. I have a choice. Church, you have a choice. Because of the brokenness of your family or your grandparents or whatever it is, you don't have to recreate that. It doesn't have to define you. There is hope bigger than our family, and his name is God. Joseph works. He has to think at home. He has to have an idea that, you know, that back at home, my, my dad thinks that I'm dead. He, he, they're going to tell him what, what didn't really happen. They're going to lie to him. And here I am, forgotten, left alone, no hope of ever making it back my family, my dad, my love. But Joseph continues to be faithful and does not allow it to affect his future. I want to end that with today for that. 
because next week is going to be, this is like part two, next week is part three, and so you got to come back. Sorry. Um, we're going to sing a song. And this song really is, I would tell you, what Joseph realizes throughout all this story. God, I need you. God, I need you. And though we may see a moment here, a glimmer where Joseph has a little bit of pride for himself, you know, tell, God interprets dreams, but, but, but tell me the dream. For a moment, I would say he has a little bit of a, a character flaw. We all have those, right? But he, he comes back next chapter and he realizes where all the source comes from and who is the one doing all the work. I wouldn't tell you that Joseph saying, tell me the dream is a, is a bad thing. We all would say, that's what, that's what I would do. Yeah, God can do it. Tell me what, the, what it is. But something about what happens next points to Joseph having a moment, maybe, of pride that doesn't really belong to him. My prayer for you is that this week you will simply say, God, I need you. I'm in prison. Maybe you feel like you're in slavery. Maybe you feel beaten and broken. Maybe the stories of your life you feel have defined you. I want to tell you, no. We need Jesus because he can change our story in a way we can't begin to understand and a way we cannot create ourselves. Lord, I come. I find my rest without you fall apart you're the one that guides my heart